Good morning. morning. How are you guys? This is an amazing church. You can tell just by in those announcements, if you knew how rare it is for a church to be this involved in reaching Native America, um, just thank God for this place and for your leadership. Uh, This is a wonderful church. You guys know Larry Taylor, wonderful guy. It's been kind of my connection point. Um, Got here this morning and um, uh, was a little nervous, a little nervous. The first time I've ever seen a jail in a church. (laughs) Right when you walk in, I said, Larry, what does a guy got to do to get in there? Better yet, what does a guy got to do to get out of there? But we are um, uh, here this morning to hear what I pray is from God's heart about what's going on in Native America and the amazing things that he's doing there. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning. I pray you prepare every heart to hear what you have to say about the people you love so dearly in Native America. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I grew up in northern New Jersey, a few hours from here. I had the typical suburban life. I grew up in the 80s, child of the 80s. And I I knew about missions. I had parents. My dad's name is Ron, if any of you know him. Um, I had parents that were very serious about mission work. But somehow Native America... And what, what is going on in Native America flew under my radar. Um, all I really knew about Native America and Native Americans, I may have seen in, in some movies or TV or history books, but that was about it. Uh, I really didn't know anything. Um, it's no wonder Billy Graham called Native Americans How sad is this, the forgotten people? 500 years of missions work in Native America. Less than 4%, according to polls, know Jesus. Um, There's something in Native America and in North America that my dad has referred to as a double blindness. There is, uh, as incredible as the hearts might be in North America and North American churches, there's kind of a blindness. There's there's more information and knowledge sometimes about what's going on overseas in missions work than what's going on in Native America. So you kind of have a a blindness of North American Christians, uh, even with great hearts, but a blindness there. And then there's a blindness on parts of Native Americans because they have been led to believe that Jesus is just a God for white men. Um, This is why my heart jumps for joy when a church like the Gathering Place raises their hand and say, no, we not only know what kind of need there is, in Native America, but we're going to do something about it. Have you guys met Taylor and Bree Kingfisher? Have, have any of you guys met these guys? Yes. So you know, I'm going to tell you, you are bringing on one of the most amazing ministry couples I have ever known in my life. They are going to make a huge impact here, and I'm so glad that it's for this church. Um, if you talk with Bree, if you talk with Taylor, they will tell you how true this is, there was a recent University of Minnesota study that calls Native young people the most devastated adolescents in North America. Sexual abuse, suicide, alcohol, drug abuse, self-harm, all off the charts statistically because As I moved to Native America, I moved to the Hopi Reservation right out of Wheaton College, and I met all these young people, and they were amazing, great personalities, wonderful kids, but each one 
seemed to feel like there was nothing for them in the future. Something about growing up surrounded by so much death. Guys, there are so many funerals of young people in Native America. The typical average man, uh, North American male, lives to be 77 years old. The average Native American male lives to be 43 years old. There can be huge levels of hopelessness and despair, a history of um, trouble with, with the government, and I don't maybe you've seen the stories from boarding schools where, where um, Native American young people were forced to turn their back on everything that made them Native American, cutting their hair and dressing a certain way and being horribly punished. And if you've seen the stories, much worse from these boarding schools. It has led Native Americans to believe, yes, that Jesus is just a white man's God. I, when I started on the Hopi Indian Reservation, I went um, to what was called the Hopi Cultural Pride Day. And my friend, my Hopi friend, had, who had told me there was literally not one Native American, not one Hopi young person he knew, not one on the entire reservation that was living for Jesus Christ. I went there and to this Pride Day and I, I heard a Native American man get on stage and say, I'm proud of my people for resisting the white man's Jesus Christ for 500 years. Not resisting a religion, the Bible, but Jesus himself. Um, Broke my heart. Um, and if you meet a young person, they're going to make decisions based on, I don't think there's anything for me. There's, because of the despair, because of, they feel like there's nothing for them outside of the reservation. So who cares what I do to dull the pain today? So all of the alcohol, drug abuse, self-harm. You say, well... Thanks for all the great news, Doug. Glad I came here this morning. <laughs> Yay. Well, hold on. That's the bad news. Years ago, Billy Graham also said that the Native American has been a sleeping giant. He is awakening the original Americans, could become the evangelist who will help win America for Christ. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, he was on to something. My Native American friends are some of the strongest, most resilient, courageous, spiritually in touch people I know. They are proclaiming this brown-skinned tribal man, by the way, is for every tribe and tongue and nation. Right now, last night in Gallup, New Mexico, as a couple of hundred Native young people and their families gathered on a basketball court, the On Eagles Wings team got in front of them after playing basketball and having a great time while working with the local community and the local uh, spiritual leadership there. And you would hear, you would be so thrilled to sit back and hear, in fact, I believe last night was Taylor saying, I have been where you are. I have tried all the things that I was told to try. I tried traditional stuff. I tried the drugs. I tried the alcohol, and it brought me to the brink. And nothing worked until I met Jesus. And now, with On Eagle's Wings, and God's doing this all through Native America, and it's not us doing it, believe me, it's the heroes, these Native American young people, and their courage. But now for 32 years, in over 120 Native American communities and reservations, On Eagle's Wings team members have led literally thousands of their Native brothers and sisters to Jesus and have seen entire communities actually turned around where, where we are told, we have been told time after time where missionaries, God bless them, that have been there for years and years and years, maybe not seen a lot of fruit, but we're preparing the ground. And then someone that looks like, sounds like me, if I'm a Native American. I see another Native American young person, 
saying, I've been where you are, and I've got to tell you about this Jesus. I'd like you to take a, a second here, if you would, because my friends are making such a huge difference in Native America. I'll tell you how in a minute, but first, let's take a quick look at this video. I'll introduce you a little bit more to On Eagle's Wings. Trees don't grow overnight. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he is asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. But he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through. Then, the heads of wheat are formed. And finally, the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle. For the harvest time has come. Thirty years ago, a seed was planted. What started as a seed has become a tree. Year after year, Miracle after miracle. We've seen God's faithfulness. Thousands of Native warriors have been a part of this. With many more to come. You may be one of them. If we celebrate God's goodness in the past. Looking forward, we ask, What might he do next? To God be the glory. I hope someday you can meet some of these amazing Native friends of mine. Uh, you probably will when you start working with uh, Taylor and Bree here. Um, so you say, well, how is this happening? God is doing incredible work in Native America, among Native Americans. How is this happening? It's, it's actually straight from the model that On Eagle's Wings uses is the same model that I believe God says if we follow this for our own sphere of friends, our, our family members, our, our, our friends that need Jesus, said, look at this story in Scripture. You'll see the on eagle's wings model, see the model for this woman. She didn't know that she was starting a model for evangelism. And then for us, as well, one of the most incredible stories in the New Testament, John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, call it the swim model, Samaritan woman model. Um, if, if you're not familiar with the story, you probably are. The Cliff Notes version is Jesus going through Samaria with his disciples. He's tired, he sits at the well for a drink. She comes up and says, and, and uh, is getting water. She's alone. Uh, it's noonday, it's, it's hot out. She's not with the women who, she, who usually typically come together. And Jesus, of course, says he's thirsty, asks for a drink. 
She says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can I do that? We do not get along. And he answers by telling her, of course, I have living water to offer. Well, you'll never be thirsty again. She kind of changes the subject, bringing up if Jesus thinks he's better than Jacob. And Jesus says, no, we're going to stay on point here. Um, He says, the water I can bring gives eternal life. She wants this water but doesn't quite get it. They keep talking and it's revealed she's had five husbands and maybe working on her sixth. Um, And she tries changing the subject again. By comparing ancestors and how they worshiped and all those things, Jesus won't fall for it. He shares more about how real worship isn't by function but by spirit and truth. She starts to catch on and in one of the most beautiful moments in the New Testament, she says, well, I know the Messiah is coming. He'll explain it all to us. And you remember what Jesus said? I am the Messiah. That's me. And her mind is blown. It's actually in the actual Greek. Her mind is was blown. Yeah. <laughs> Studied it for a year at Wheaton. You can tell, right? She runs back to town to tell everyone. It says, leaving her water jar right from Scripture, the woman went back to the town, said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward many of them, the Samaritans from that town. Are you ready for this? Believed in him. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. If, if her story was a movie title, you might call it the awesome power of one changed life. She is the world's first missionary. She doesn't know it, but she's so excited about what she has found in Jesus. She can't wait to tell the people she loves. Is that us, Lord? Or are we sitting on this incredible good news that could change the planet? Um, I think sometimes we feel like if people are going to be evangelized, um, they're going to get to know Jesus. It's going to be through through some great pastor, and that does happen with Pastor Rob here. Um, Or maybe it'll be done by a professional evangelist, Greg Laurie or Billy Graham, someone with a master's of theology. No, that's not who Jesus chose to be his first evangelist. Someone with one failed relationship after another, not many friends, judging by the conversation she has with Jesus, doesn't think very highly of herself at all, feels very unloved, maybe having a lot in common with people we interact with every day. At work, school, on our sports teams, at home. She's at a very low place when she meets Jesus. But somehow, within a few minutes, she is jumping up and down, excited, can't wait to go into town and tell the people who probably have turned their back on her, who probably feel like she's an enemy because she's lived an immoral life. She has that kind of reputation. She doesn't care. She goes, I have to tell everybody. That's the heart of an On Eagle's Wings team member. It was the heart of this Samaritan woman, and dear God, let it be our heart. Isn't that our prayer, she says, uh, that as his followers, the people we love will meet our rescuer? There's all sorts of programs out there, and they're great, and there's politics out there, and it can kind of make a difference sometimes, but nothing changes everything like a heart changed by Jesus Christ. Is that how we're living our lives? Um, It's what God is still using to bring about the miracles of on eagle's wings, rescued native warriors from tribes throughout the U.S. and Canada, bringing hope of Jesus to their own people and sometimes seeing entire communities change. Let's look. It's worked for on eagle's wings. It worked for the Samaritan woman. And I promise you, if you follow this model, something like this, it will work for you, even with the hardest people to reach that you might have in your sphere. Let's look real quick at this Samaritan woman model. Um, Let's look at five characteristics of someone who needs Jesus that will, who they will listen to characteristics of someone who needs Jesus, who they will listen to. First of all, if we look at the Samaritan woman and on eagle's wings, it's going to be someone from their tribe. Um, In John 4, 28 through 30, she says, come and see this man that I met. The moment the Samaritan woman gave her heart to Jesus, she became someone's best chance at Jesus. When you wake up, 
start getting ready for the day, do, do we recognize, do you recognize, do we say, I am somebody's best chance at Jesus? Why? Because you're in their tribe. We're all in lots of tribes. Soccer mom tribe, where we work is a tribe. Um, our family, people with similar backgrounds, similar experiences, just by being where God has put you, you are biographically <laughs> credentialed, divinely positioned. Because who's a cheerleader going to listen to the most about what's happening in life? Another cheerleader? Who's a soccer player going to listen to? Who's a, who's a teacher going to listen to? Who's a PTA parent going to listen to? Person who's sharing their experiences, people from their tribe. And everyone in this room is in multiple tribes. Maybe you're a cancer survivor, you're a veteran. Your tribes are a part of what divinely positions you. Guys, we will miss this if we don't recognize that our lives are a series of divinely orchestrated situations. In Acts, it says that God determined before time began where men would live and when they would live. This is the God that cares about and knows when a, when a sparrow falls on the ground that captures our every tear when we're mourning. The Bible says he cares about your circumstances. He knows where you are, and you are where you work on purpose. You go to school where you go on purpose. You go to church where you go on purpose. And even if you're struggling and having problems in, in family relationships, you're in that family on purpose. God has placed you there to be his ambassador, his representative, to share his great hope that this world needs so desperately. So it's going to be someone from their tribe that they're going to listen to. It's going to be someone telling their hope story. John 4, 39. Many believed because of her testimony. We call it in, in On Eagle's Wings the hope story. A little less uh, religious language. 1 Peter 3, 15. We know this scripture. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. When you think about, I have seen it in my own life, the hurt we have experienced and it's not fun when we're going through it. It can be awful. But that hurt uniquely positions you to talk with somebody who's going through the same hurt about your Jesus. I have been there. Your hurt, think of it this way, can actually give someone heaven. This is the power of the on eagle's wings. Of the on eagle's wings, these many change lives, proclaiming as one voice. This is probably the most important phrase. They say, "You are not alone. I've been where you are. I've been the abuse victim. I've tried it all, but then, but then Jesus." And we've all got those, but then Jesus times. So you say, "Well, I don't have much of a hope story. I was kind of prenatally Christian. I was a, a Christian in the womb." I, didn't, I haven't been to drug rehab or anything. It doesn't matter. If you have had a financial struggle that God brought you through, if you've had a, a health struggle that God brought you through, if you've had a wandering child that God has ministered to you about, you have a hope story. The enemy would like for you not to be aware of this because he knows it's that hope story, just like with the Samaritan woman, just like with these on eagle's wings warriors, as we call them, that that hope story will draw people to your Savior because people can argue with the Bible. They can argue with your politics. They can't argue with your hope story. This is mine. And all I'm telling you is I tried everything. And then Jesus. By the way, um, my dad wrote a book called Hope When Your Heart is Breaking. Um, we are going to be, my wife, incredible wife, Anna, by the way, who is, she's Navajo, Native American. She is the world's most gorgeous Navajo. You can look it up in the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> That's her. And as she reminds me many times, the Navajos are the largest tribe and the most awesome tribe in Native America. Um, Anna and I will be back there 
Um, and, and you can pick up one of those books for free. It's amazing. I hope you will. Um, first, and, and there's lots of other resources there. If you have any interest in what's going on with Sign Eagles Wings in Native America, please come back to that table and say hi to us. Someone from their tribe telling their hope story, someone who's all about Jesus. Remember, come and see a man, not a religion, not a meeting, not a political party. She keeps it all about him, and so should we. Don't get drawn off into all the other stuff. There's so many distractions, social media everywhere. Forget all that. It was the man that changed you. It was a man who was God that changed you. Stick to him. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, Paul says, I resolve to know nothing but Jesus. When OEW share their Jesus, man, they are sharing, knowing that people who are listening know the government history in Native America, that abuse and murders were done in the name of Jesus not so long ago. And they say, that wasn't my Jesus. That wasn't Jesus. That was his followers confused and maybe not even his followers. Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. So don't let the history of religion or all the arguments keep you from telling people about the Savior that rescued you. So it's going to be someone from their tribe they'll listen to, someone telling their hope story, someone who's all about Jesus, and it's going to be someone who will not let their fear decide what they do and how much they do. She had, the Samaritan woman had lots of stuff she could have been afraid of going back to this town. Oh, my reputation, what are they going to think of me? They're going to laugh at me. Oh, here she goes again. Forget that. None of that stuff mattered. They might laugh at me. You know, for On Eagle's Wings team members, for some of them, turning to Jesus literally to their families means you're turning your back on your family and, the, and, and your ancestors. To be baptized in some tribes means to say, you want nothing to do with us anymore. It's not fair. It's not what they're saying. But this is how far divided, how much the enemy has done to separate Native Americans and Jesus. So they could, these team members could be all timid, say, I, I, can't get, I can't go on and on about Jesus here. But actually, I've seen some of the like, physically smallest, most timid Native Americans get in front of gang members, drug dealers in the middle of towns with hundreds of people listening and say, I got to tell you about my Jesus. Those 9-11 uh, heroes who ran into those buildings, I'm, they were scared, I'm sure. But the fact that people were dying was more of a motivation to them than their own safety. Lord, let it be for us. John Wayne put it this way, courage is being scared to death but saddling up anyway. Was that a good John Wayne? Probably not. Um, that's the thing about our, letting our fear decide. Me, 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 it's all about me. Courage is all about them. Finally, they'll listen to someone who will let God break their heart. A chilling verse in Matthew 24, 12, the love of most Christians will grow cold as Jesus gets closer to his return. What? Shouldn't, as he gets closer, shouldn't we be more on fire? Well, apparently we won't be. The opposite of a broken heart is a cold one. Lord, is that going to be us? Is that going to be you? Is that going to be me? You see, the point where the Samaritan woman stops with excuses from her head and opens up her heart, that's is where finally the truth penetrates. Last night, Taylor gave me the permission to share this. Last night, Taylor Kingfisher had shared the gospel. He came up to my dad and he put his head on my dad's shoulder and he wept for a few minutes. He said, Mr. Hutch, Papa Hutch, I just want things to change. I want my people to stop their hurt. Are our hearts that passionate about our people, my brothers and sisters in Christ that need him so desperately? To wrap up, I want to share an experience that Bree Kingfisher, we, we didn't plan this and say, hey, I hope there's a cool, cool story that'll happen when Taylor and Bree, Doug speaking, 
on Sunday. I promise, this just happened. This happened two nights ago. And I'm going to read to you. Bree wrote it down. I'm going to wrap it up, wrap us up um, by reading this to you. Here's what she said. I met a girl named Chantel, which is crazy because that's my middle name. She's out with the team talking with people in the middle of the, of the community there during the event. The leader, Lance, said, there's a girl sitting over there on the stairs. So I looked over and I saw her. I thought she was like a kid. As soon as I walked over there, my heart instantly broke. She had no shoes on. She had a bruise on her foot. Her hair was messed up and she smelled of alcohol. I introduced myself and she instantly started crying. Finally, she opened up and said she had been kicked out of her home. She told me what she was going through and I told her my story. I tried to encourage her as much as I could. She prayed with me and asked Jesus into her heart. Hallelujah. I gave my Crocs to her <laughs> that I left on the bus. I left them there just to have them, but I think I actually left them there for her. I got to connect her with Kevin, our, the local leader here. If we weren't there, this card would not have been filled out. Because Chantel told me she was about to go to the bridge over I-40 and take her life. She was on the way to the event. And God brought her there to meet him, our great shepherd, who leaves the 99 to go find the one. She said, I praise God for allowing the opportunity because I almost didn't go over there. And listen to this. I'll wrap up with this. The longer that we wait to tell people about Jesus, the longer they have to wait for the hope that they can find in him. 